So how's everyone doing today? Welcome to this demonstration of Casper Hyperledger interoperability. So interoperability and open source are the themes today, and these are the two things that we are going to talk about uh, in today's demonstration. I'm Ashok Ranadeve, Director of um, Professional Services at Casper Labs. With me, I have Sham Nagarajan, Executive Partner, Web3 and Interoperability uh, Sustainability for IBM. All right, thank you, Ashok. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, the journey for Hyperledger has been around seven years. And in those seven years, we have been um, very quite successful in, in standing up private permission networks across different enterprises. We've seen and done that very successfully. Uh, instance, the business case that we're going to talk about is actually interoperability of a private permission network with the public permissionless network. And this is the real live engagements that we are doing with some large institutions, government organizations that's in progress as well. So the scenario that we are sharing here is about a bond network that has the assets. These are financial assets that are issued by um, the treasury of the country and are maintained in the private permission ledger. A number of banking organizations are part of this um, ledger and they are uh, entitled to buy and sell within this network. Parallelly, we have a, a cash network that's running on a public blockchain that is permissionless and the cash network is primarily used for settlement across all different parties. So the cash side of it, the currency side of it, and the token side of it is actually maintained in the public chain. The interoperability scenario is where a party, Alice, that owns a bond is willing to sell the bond to anyone else in the network. And Bob is a buyer, and buyer wants to get this bond from Alice. Now, the asset ledger primarily allows transfer of the bonds, but the settlement has to occur on the cash ledger. So in the cash ledger, Alice and Bob have equivalent accounts where they have tokens and can settle between the both the parties. The equation that we have to solve here is how do you uh, do a transaction making sure the both networks are aware of the state of the transaction in each, each network. So in this situation, we're gonna, you know, uh, Ashok is, walk, is gonna walk us through how we are solving this. This is a scenario where uh, we have used Project Weaver and uh, Atomic Swap, especially hash time lock uh, scenario in order to solve this problem. And, uh, you know, Ashok, why don't you walk through the, the next shot? Yeah, so let's go through the, let's go through the, the sequence of events here. Alice, uh, and Bob both have accounts on both ledgers. So the asset ledger, which is uh, running on Fabric, and the cash ledger, which is running on Casper, which is a public permissionless network. So Alice owns a bond, and Bob shows interest in buying that. So Alice locks the asset with a hash. Bob, uh, Bob creates um, agreement on, on the cash side to uh, Bob shows interest to, uh, to buy this asset and then transfers the tokens on the cash network uh, to Alice's account. Again, that is also time lock. When Alice accepts these uh, cash transfer, the bond is released for uh, Bob on the, on the asset side. So this is interlocked. If the transaction fails at any stage, the, the original state is uh, established. So the if, if, for example, within the time period given, if Bob doesn't transfer the cash or Alice doesn't accept the tokens uh, or the cash, this uh, state will be restored but Alice will go back to owning the, owning the, the asset and Bob will um, retain his, uh, the cash that, um, that he wants. And I'm going to demonstrate this um, on our, our live uh, with uh, our test network. So you will see the deploys actually happening. Uh, let me switch over. Um, so this is the bond network, and this is the cash network. So the cash network, as I mentioned, is running on Casper, um, and the bond network is running on 
hyperledger fabric. So let's log in as Alice. <coughs> so Alice has certain bonds. I have created, uh, there is one bond that I have specifically kept the number as 111 value so that it is easy to spot. Uh, this is the bond she owns and Bob uh, is interested in buying, buying this, uh, this bond. So when I log in as Bob here, I see the number of bonds and I see this bond um, 111 face value is owned by Alice and I want to initiate purchase. So I initiate purchase and send a request. When the request is sent, Alice will see this request when she logs in. So you see the notification. This, this tells Alice that Bob is interested in buying the bond. She looks at the, uh, the scenario and she is happy to sell the bond to, to Bob and she creates a secret, uh, secret phrase which will be lock, locking, the, uh, locking the asset. We are seeing it here because this is a demo in, in real scenario, obviously we won't, we won't see any of these. So she creates and she approves the transfer. Now this um, is going to get locked with uh, a certain time um, as, as a parameter. So it will be locked for a certain time. Now this is the locked hash. Let's just copy this and I'll just paste it here. Okay. Now we go to the cache ledger which is running on Casper. We log in as Bob. We go to transfer tokens. We see that the same uh, hash is here. So Bob knows that Alice has now, um, now accepted the offer and he is now transferring the tokens or the cash. So he approves from his side. This is the deploy hash. Let's record this. Since this is a public network, we can observe the behavior um, of, of um, the transaction on the, and the Casper block explorer. So what's happening behind the scene here is if I go to um, the, the Casper network. So the Casper network has a block time of 32 seconds. So it's going to take time for the transaction to be recorded, but we can observe this here. So when you see um, the, the deploy going through the network, that means that particular token transfer has occurred. Let's give it a, a couple of seconds. And what has happened so far is the transaction, you know, the asset was locked in the Hyperledger okay. blockchain network. Uh, hash time lock was initiated. So there's a period of time that the asset is locked for. Then it was handshaked with the Casper network. And in the Casper network, that approval for transfer of tokens came through. And you saw Bob actually approve the transfer of tokens to Alice, who's in the Casper network. And that approval is going through this network and this is where you're seeing yep. that confirmation. You see that the deploy hash that we had recorded is the same deploy hash and token transfer has happened. If you go through the details of the raw data, you will see uh, the number of tokens that are transferred and all the details. So um, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to the Casper network. Ca or one network, uh, login as Alice. Sorry, login as Bob here and to the cache ledger. 
So, you actually see the number of tokens also would be reduced. Okay. So, when you log in as Alice, uh, you have to accept the tokens that Bob has transferred. You now give in the same secret key that you had typed in on the asset uh, side. For you locking. For locking. For locking. You claim the tokens. Again, this claim goes in as a deploy through uh, to the network. So because now the tokens are getting transferred from the locked contract to Alice's account. Let's note down this uh, deploy hash and go back to our block explorer. Again, we had to wait for like half a minute here. And, and what has happened is it's still within that time lock period, right? Um, in this situation, I think the time lock period is about five minutes. Um, but you could set it up to whatever is possible. Yeah. Just because the workflow has multiple networks and you have to log back, all those kind of things. So as Alice claims the token, then the confirmation of the claim is now going to be corresponded back to the Hyperledger network. And in the Hyperledger network, now Bob is going to see the, the transfer yeah. occur as well. So here you see the, the, the same deploy hash here. So now, um, sorry. So now what has happened is Alice has now got possession of the tokens, right? Um, but it is still uh, still locked into the contract. If the bond doesn't get transferred, it will be reverted, right? So let's go back to um, Bob here. Uh, since he has completed his commitment towards the transaction, he should be able to see uh, the bond. Now, one thing that we should note here is if you go to the, the data here, the secret code is actually revealed into, into the chain. However, however, um, nobody else who is observing the chain will be able to claim the bonds because the bonds are now locked for Bob and nobody else can uh, get them transferred. So here is the secret. Let me increase the font size a little bit. You see the secret um, code here? That's, that's here and it's observable on chain, but nobody else can um, you know, misuse it, so to say. So Bob goes to his his thing, and he he now knows the the secret uh, as it is typed. He claims the bonds. Okay, bond claimed successfully, and now if you go here, you see that the bond is transferred. Uh, in, in Bob's account. So, um, so to conclude, what we have demonstrated here is a transaction of asset on a permissioned network is enabled through uh, a, a synced and locked uh, transaction of cash or tokens on a permissionless network. So this opens up huge number of applications, as Sham was saying, because a lot of uh, financial institutes um, have permission network and their assets are locked on permission network. And that's something that they need from security uh, you know, perspective. Um, but as the public chains have demonstrated more traction and more reliability um, and CBDCs are coming into play, it's kind of imperative that we demonstrate how they can interoperate together. Uh, this code is going to be open sourced. We are going to keep it open uh, for people to use it and you know uh, play around with it. And internally, it uses uh, Project Weaver, which now is going to get merged into Cactus, and the new new name is Cacti. So we are very excited that this is a very scalable, industrialized piece of code that can be put into production or used in your projects as you work with your clients. So, great. Yep. Thank you very so much that's for all. the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Uh, any questions? Happy to take any questions. Did you, did you give us an uh, URL for the GitHub for the code? Yes, we will definitely uh, put it up. Okay, great. Yep. Did you know it was mm -hmm. always negative side of uh, using blockchain.
<laughs> you know, sometimes organizations over engineer and you may not need in blockchain. So uh, really qualifying what you're applying the technology for is very important. Yeah. Um, and the other side is uh, also, you know, choice of permission versus public as well. You know, when do you need one versus the other? So it's, it's basically application. Like, is there a negative side of using a hammer? Maybe yes. If you use it on a nail, that's the right application. You use it uh, on, if a you're on a uh, on a head, it may not be. So it's, it's it's where you it's a technology where you where you use it, find the right application and the balance between the options that technology gives you. As Shyam mentioned, permission, not permission, you know. Um, so so those things that you need to keep in mind. How decentralized it is. What kind of uh, security it is giving you. What is your what is your right application, right? If if you use if you keep that in mind, um, it, it it's totally uh, the right thing to do. So, so Weaver handles the relay part uh, behind the scene. So the secret actually is revealed only when Alice um, is accepting the tokens. And that's when it's available on the pub. So, so we, we have to understand the difference between public and private network, right? So in a permission network, there is no access for others to kind of go through it, right? But for a public network, your data is getting posted and it's available open. Uh, anybody can query the data and see what the secret code is, but it's revealed at a at a point where it's no longer possible to use that secret code and claim the bond for anybody else other than Bob. Okay. So, so Bob every time has to go to the explorer, take the secret. So there there is there are ways to do it. Either Bob goes through that, or you find another means to to pass on that secret code to Bob. It could be done through de several different ways, right? And, and there are established technologies to pass messages across two parties in a very secure manner. So we could use that, or Bob just goes to the explorer. I mean, that's. But remember, the time of the secret exchange is only after Alice has been paid or claims the yeah. tokens. That's very important. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. The SDK allows you to register for events. So if you're Bob, you're listening for events of a lock, let's say from Alice, and then in your application, you add suitable code in your image listener to submit a lock in response or submit a claim. So there's a four-step protocol that uh, Ashok showed you earlier, right? So yeah. you can, but yeah. There, but there will be people who will be listening to this event. Yeah, so it, which is perfectly fine because the fine. locks are made in favor of some party. If you supply a secret, if, if a third party, let's say David supplies a secret, it's not like David yeah. gets the asset. Bob, yeah. David Bob will not be it. able to because it's it's transferred only to that account. And by the way, that's Ram uh, who leads uh, Weaver project for IBM Research. Yeah, he's the guy who wrote the code. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a presentation later in the afternoon on Weaver, so if you're interested. Yeah. All right. All right. Can I ask another question? Sure. So we know that. What is, the, what is the question? Is there anyone on earth who yeah. can so, turn off the blockchain? Yeah. So that's the, that's the best thing. Like if you go to any centralized parties, like one of these big, big organizations, they have the keys to turn on and turn off. In case of blockchain, say, let's take the example of Casper, right? Casper has 100 validators on the chain. Now, if 10 of them shut down, the chain will continue. Right? So there is a minimum num threshold after which the chain is not sustainable, but that's a, a large number. It, typically what we call it as a 51% account, right? Yeah. But, but it's a very large number. So in case of blockchain, that's one of the advantages that you have that you know, there is no one who can turn off the blockchain. Well, you know, j just to add to that, this is why decentralized is important. Yeah. There is also the distributed side of it that is also, again, gives you a level of comfort, not as much as decentralized, but distributed is better than yeah. centralized. And then there is the centralized. So 
look, the reality is that when we started out as pure returns for blockchain, we said everything has to be decentralized. And then realized that is not the only way how you could use blockchain. You, there are other forms of doing it. And ranges bef because of what you're applying it to, right? And in those situations, you know, I, I see Amazon as an offering out there, which is QLDB, which is a centralized blockchain ledger, right? Which only makes sense if, uh, you know, all you want is uh, irrefutable proof that's in a ledger and that you want access to all other people and you don't care about the distributed or the uh, decentralized nature of it. At the same time, you have these public networks that are offering a different level of comfort where there is no reason how the, the network will be dis uh, disturbed because of uh, any outage or a government taking over a, a computer system and the likes because of decentralization. Right? It's, yeah. it's all depends on what are you applying it for. Yeah, the, your application matters a lot, but, but Casper, for example, can give you that option. So Casper can run as a permission network. The same node with a config file setup can be run as a permission network or we already have a public network that is running. And you can kind of find uh, a space in between what we call as a hybrid network, right? You can find exactly what you want to go on public network, what you want to retain on private network. Companies may want to have private network because they have certain regulatory constraints on data, you know, visibility of their customers, or they want may want to keep that data to themselves. They may want to reveal a certain portion of that data. So again, it comes to like what problem, I, what business problem am I going to solve, right? Correct. Yeah. So how do you manage the identity? Do you have two different identity managers? How do you manage the identity? That's that's a good question. Yeah, we'll have to manage. So that's a problem which is which is separate and which should be kind of this this is a contained solution that we are offering. Right? Identity management in itself is is something important. And how do you like make sure that Alice here and Alice there are same is 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 a problem. But that's not addressed by this solution. But I think there are enough available solutions to, to ensure that. The, the I wonder if layers and if we can self-care because it uh, are not so technically familiar with layers and if we can the, they can. No. They can. Um, but you also don't want to over engineer it, right? Yeah. There are all already established uh, IAMs that can help you uh, make those kind of associations. That said, if you had a decentralized identity already established, you know there's no reason why these networks yeah. can't work with it. But good question, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much.